Great. Thank you so much for having me. And, uh, and thank you everyone for coming today. I'm uh, hoping that I'll be able to spend some time with you and give you a bit of an overview of the lay of the land for the medical technology industry in Canada. I hope you'll learn a lot. Um, I'm going to make sure that there's time at the end for questions, but um, even as I'm presenting, if you have questions and I think, um, and if it's okay, we drop them in the chat. And even if I don't get to them during the presentation, it'll be great to capture those and, and we can um, get back to them. So I'm just gonna start out by giving a really simple overview of what is MedTech Canada. So we're the national association that represents the medical device industry that's operating in Canada. We've got about 120 uh, member companies, although um, it, there, are, there are many more in Canada, especially in the startup space. But our membership, um, it's a diverse membership that consists of both multinationals that are operating in Canada. So that's like the Medtronics and the Baxters and the Johnson Johnsons of the world. Um, and uh, Canadian-owned small and medium medical technology companies as well. Um, we work uh, essentially to represent the industry in Canada and try to promote um, the use of innovative medical technologies in the healthcare system. Um, I put a link to our website in case you want to peruse around there and uh, and check it out while we're talking and learn a bit more. But Essentially, if you look at our vision and mission for the association, we primarily focus on getting technologies into the Canadian healthcare system. So we typically don't work on things like um, venture capital investment or trade or those types of sort of issues in the med tech industry. We really work with companies um, once they get close to or at the point that they're ready to bring technologies into the system or they have lots of technologies in the system and work with governments and other stakeholders to um, you know capitalize on the technology system for the benefit those technologies for the benefit of patients and, and, if, and if there's anything that comes up in the chat on that I should address while I'm talking feel free to flag it for me but um, or I can do it at the end so I thought the best way to start is just to answer the question, how does a technology go from, you know, idea and into the, into, you know, use into the healthcare system? And, and I, I, sorry, I should have said in Canada on this slide, but I, you know, it, uh, in any province in, in Canada. So this is not simple. Um, I think I meet a lot of, a lot of innovators um and uh and and a lot of uh folks involved in really great incredible technologies i hear about these amazing innovations um intuitively it's very obvious that they're going to be fantastic for the system and fantastic for patients but um it's not that easy to have a great idea and to develop technology that uh that seems like a no-brainer and they get it used in the canadian healthcare system and there's no simple answer to this question, but as you can see, some of the factors that impact that are, you know, um, a lack of coordination across the healthcare system. Uh, you know, there aren't a lot of processes in place specifically for medical technologies to move them through their journey as they enter the healthcare system. We have a very fragmented healthcare system. So, you know, when you think of Canada and the fact that provinces have jurisdiction over healthcare, you're really almost operating in, it's like 10 different mini countries um, in bringing technologies into the system. Um, we'll talk a lot about procurement today, uh, kind of call it the P word in the medical technology industry because it's a big barrier and a, and a much, um, has a quite a large implication on how technologies get into the system. Um, and our system really is um, cost focused. So, you know, it, it's, it's, there's not a lot of good methodologies and good ways to really, uh, a lot of our healthcare system has a lens of, you know, um, trying to mitigate and, and, and practice cost containment measures versus, you know, overall value to the system. So I, I thought I'd just kind of walk through this journey give you a sense. And here's something, you know, I, I started at MedTech Canada 10 years ago, I came from government. Um, so my background in Forte is really navigating my way through government and figuring out how 
you can trigger government levers to help, you know, improve different things in society. And I was asked, you know, can you kind of figure out how to visualize how a technology gets into the system? So this slide looks wonderful. And if this were the, the very simple way that this happens, um, that would be great. Um, but I'm going to walk you through each step and also be cognizant that this is not such a linear circular pathway that, you know, that you do A and then you do B and you do C and, you know, by the time you're done, it's in the system. So let's get into this a little bit more. But as you can see here, you know, the, and I know there's lots of innovators or potential innovators um, here today, you know, having a great idea and doing that research and development that's just the start of a pretty long journey um, for a medical device. And that plus getting regulatory approval is what we refer to as the pre-market. Post-market is when you can actually start, you know, um, bringing medical technologies into the system and that's a whole other world. So um, this is going to be a basic 101. Everybody's looking at the slide going, yep, we know, we know, we know. Uh, but, uh, Thank you. Ideas, you know, starting with, um, so we'll start with an unmet need um, for a new technology or, you know, innovations are often um, improvements on existing technologies. And they come from all over. They come from industry, from physicians, entrepreneurs. I mean, we certainly saw during the pandemic, and I'm going to talk a bit about the pandemic, but, you know, lots of, uh, lots of folks coming to the table who had never been in the med tech industry coming to, you know, help with respirators and things like that. Research and development, another area that I don't need to tell you, but uh, you know, collecting evidence and having clinical involvement in testing um, and designing a product. Next step is regulatory approval. So Health Canada through the federal government regulates medical devices for their safety and efficacy. And you have to have approval from Health Canada to sell medical devices in Canada Medical devices are divided into four classes. Just so you know, there's class one, two, three, and four. The higher the class of the medical device, the more intense and, and challenging the process is to get that into the system. The classes are, you do a self-assessment on these classes. And, and um, so a class one device is something simple, you know, a medical device you get in a drugstore, for example, like a Band-Aid. A class four medical device might be a very complex, you know, diagnostic piece of equipment like an MRI or an implant, like a pacemaker. Um, it depends on the impact to the patient and the patient outcome. And that is a lot of how the class system works. There is, by the way, um, there are medical devices that are used in the system that have not gotten their Health Canada approval yet. And that's a program called the Special Access Program where a physician can actually um, uh, apply for that and uh, have that device used in the system. And, and one example of that is um, there's a, a procedure that you may or may not be familiar with for um, heart valve replacements called um, TAVI. Um, it's, an, it's a minimally invasive procedure alternative to an open heart surgery. The TAVI technology was being used in Canada for a number of years before it actually got its regulatory approval. So there are exceptions to that. Health technology assessment. Um, this is uh, an area that actually doesn't typically um, impact most medical devices. When you think in Canada, for example, there's over 4,000 medical devices approved in, by Health Canada every year. Um, we don't assess as a country 4,000 technologies to say whether people should use them or not. But usually when something's quite new or innovative or quite different, or if there's been a request from a government or a hospital to have an assessment done. Um, there's a process called health technology assessment where there is, um, you know, a, a collection of both health economics, um, information, um, patient impact information, all of those types of things that are analyzed and, and to come up with a recommendation to say yes, this has value to the healthcare system. Um, there's a, you know, uh, for the cost and this will have value to patients. And we do think the healthcare system should move forward and start using these technology, this technology. There are just for the sake, it's, it's, we don't have a coordinated system in Canada for this. Um, 
most provinces have their own health technology association. So in Ontario, for example, it's OTAC at the regional level. So some, you know, uh, Theta is an example of a regional health technology assessment body. They often work with OTAC, but some hospitals have their own. It would make sense that somebody like SickKids would because pediatric technologies are different um, than those used on adults in some cases. And then at the national level, there's CADETH, which does a lot more work in pharmaceuticals, but also touches on the medical technology world. So that might happen in the journey that an assessment happens across a technology. Even if it's a recommendation to use the technology, it still doesn't mean that it gets adopted into the system. Other factors that impact a technology getting into the system are, you know, hospital decisions. So do they have the funding? Can they pay for that technology within their existing global budget? How do they reallocate even within a hospital, within departments to bring in new technologies? And, you know, there's lots of technologies that get introduced where one department will have to make the investment and it's actually going to save money in a different department. And so sometimes those decisions have to happen. Um, another area, and it's kind of a, 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 it can be a real challenge, is if there's a technology that um, essentially creates a new procedure, for example, there might not be a physician billing code in place for a physician to use that technology. So if there's a new surgery, there might not be a way for them to bill for their you know, time to do that procedure. Um, we work with uh, physician associations like the Ontario Medical Association to try to develop those fee codes in partnership with government, but uh, that can be a barrier sometimes, and you know that needs to be in place. Technical fee codes are, if you're not familiar, they're another type of fee code where the government will allocate um, some money every time a device is used, so that over time it helps to contribute to the cost of that. So that you know happens for certain technologies, but not not at everyone. And then you know tradition, you know. Clinicians need to be trained and hospitals need to assess um, what they need to do to change their processes to use the technology. Um, the government's role, um, you know, they play a role in the fee code development. Sometimes the government will create a program that um, will directly fund technologies. So, for example, there was a time when, you know, Ontario expanded its breast cancer screening program and updated all of the equipment or not all, but much of the equipment to do that. But that is not, um, that does not happen with every technology. Sometimes there's a, a, a you know, specific um, disease area that the government launches a strategy around and that may um, pay for some devices for a period of time um, or a wait time strategy might pay for new MRIs or things like that. But there really is no specific program or government strategy to say, here's a bucket of funding that is dedicated to new innovation that comes into the system. And that's important for innovators to remember. And then procurement, and I've got the, the, the picture up here of, um, of the, uh, you know, blow my mind, this is, this is a challenge. So procurement is the process of actually purchasing medical devices. And that's administered by either group purchasing organizations, shared service organizations, or hospital procurement departments. They put out um, RFPs, and or sometimes RFI is just, we want to know if this technology exists out there before we put out an RFP. Um, and then, you know, companies have to put a bid in uh, to um, that gets analyzed um, and scored before and against other proposals. Um, before purchasing a product and, you know, determining things like um, the terms and conditions under which that product is purchased and, uh, and a whole bunch of things. I think a lot of people probably didn't think a lot about procurement before the pandemic, but maybe the pandemic gave you a taste as you watched, you know, for example, the federal government secure contracts for, for vaccines and things like that, um, that this is an important process. Um, the challenge with procurement um, and the way procurement has evolved in Canada is that most of the evaluation for medical devices are around the cost. And so oftentimes procurement groups spend their time really focusing on companies competing with each other 
to drive down the price of a device or a technology. So they're not really looking at what we call the, the full value, value-based procurement, which is where you're actually scoring and evaluating these bids based on other factors like what's the impact of patients or how does this make hot, you know, hospital processes more efficient to increase their capacity and things like that. And so that's a, that is a struggle and a challenge in Canada. It's a challenge in lots of other countries, but um, probably more so in Canada than many other countries. I'll give you an example. In Europe, a number of years ago, they legislated that um, any procurement that is done in healthcare has to have a level of value-based procurement incorporated into that. We don't have that kind of a mandate here in Canada. And then on top of that, there are a number of different procurement groups. If you're a, an individual hospital in Canada, you may buy stuff sometimes through your own purchasing department. You might sign on to a, a, a contract with a, there's only one national group purchasing organization in Canada. It's not government under, un, you know, run or owned. Um, but you may sign on to that. You may sign on to a regional, the shared service organizations, which um, do this uh, in certain regions. Um, and then again, you're dealing with 10 different provinces within each province. Uh, some provinces like Alberta just have one purchasing group, uh, which is great. It makes life a lot easier. If you're in Ontario, I think there's at this point, a lot of them are merging these days, but you've got eight or nine shared service organizations. You've got health pro operating here and you've got the provincial government looking at potentially consolidating that over time, but it's a messy landscape um, in procurement. And that is often a barrier where, you know, hospitals or a, a clinical uh, champion will say, I think this technology is great. And then it goes through the procurement process. And what the contract ends up being for, you know, maybe an alternative technology that is, uh, that is um, less expensive, but may not have the impact on patients. So, Thought I'd mention that um, and walk you through that. Diffusion and adoption is, uh, you know, it's intuitive, but, uh, you know, diffusion is, you know, okay, now we've got one hospital or three hospitals or, you know, a, a certain, a few physicians in a hospital using a technology. Um, that's great. Now, how do we get that across the system? And they're really not a lot of, uh, there's very few instances, this, this often happens organically. There, there's very few instances when, when I've seen in my tenure at Mentech Canada where there is a deliberate strategy to take a best practice and bring that across the whole healthcare system in a timely way. So it often happens slowly, organically over time with a lot of hard work and a lot of raising awareness. Um, and then adoption, which, you know, I've put some bullet points, but, uh, you know, what does that mean for, for patients and for Canadians? You know, lots of great stuff happen when new technologies get adopted and uh, adoption also for an innovator um, is uh, the end and the beginning of the life cycle. Because obviously, you know, when med tech companies are established, you need to actually be generating revenue to be able to put funds back into working on new innovations. And so it's an important um, piece around not only making life better for patients and for Canadians, but also to help grow and sustain the medical technology industry in Canada. So that kind of walks you through the pathway. Um, I, I thought I would also, and so feel free, like I said, if you're writing down questions, all that kind of stuff, please feel free. Um, and if I'm using any terminology that doesn't, you know, that doesn't make sense or isn't intuitive or you want to learn more about, let me know. And I'm happy to sort of talk that through. Um, when you've been in the industry a long time, you, you, you sometimes, uh, you know, start throwing around, um, uh, you know, terminology that, that, you know, most people don't uh, use in their daily lives. So um, I wanted to talk a little bit about when we talk about trends, one of the things I wanted to do was talk about the impact of the pandemic on the medical technology sector, because this has probably had um, 
the biggest impact on our industry in terms of awareness. And what I mean by that is, so I, you know, um, you know, I'm gonna give a great background uh, uh, about myself. I worked in the Minister of Health's office in Ontario before I went to MedTech Canada. I'd never heard of MedTech Canada. And medical devices in the medical technology industry is just not something that people think about. It, it really isn't. I, you know, people don't walk into a hospital and, and start looking around at the devices that are being used on them and, and think about the industry that's behind them and the innovation involved in them. And, you know, um, and as a stakeholder to government, it's just not something people, you know, it's not the hospital association. It's not a physician association. It's not the nurses association. It's not so a lot of people don't think about medical technologies. But if I can take you back and uh, a trip down memory lane, um, <clears throat> you know, as we all experienced um, in Canada, we had a real crisis when it came to medical technologies. And these are some of the headlines ripped. You can look at the dates right out of end of March, uh, beginning of April on some of the big challenges we faced that were creating you know, significant, um, rightfully significant levels of anxiety um, to society on not being able to access. In, and in this case, you know, when you think about PPE, fairly simple technologies, you know, ventilators are more complex, but there was, you know, it was a challenge. And I think people, um, if, you, if you start to, you know, see what happened as we moved through the pandemic, um, people really started to understand why the medical technology industry and why medical innovations and medical devices are so critical to our healthcare system. And so most of what happened during the pandemic was um, a challenge, difficult for the healthcare system, very difficult for us for our pandemic response. There were a couple of things that happened that were, that were great. And I'll, down here at the bottom, you can see the um, bottom right hand side, the, uh, uh, one of the big things that happened during the pandemic is we moved forward on virtual care. And it's interesting because uh, I know I had been working for years leading up to the pandemic on getting virtual technologies adopted in the healthcare system. And I'm talking beyond doing a virtual visit with a doctor, like the world of virtual care. I'll talk about that a bit later, but you know, it's extensive. You've got remote monitoring of patients. You've got a whole bunch of other things that enable patients to, you know, care for themselves at home or care for themselves at different settings or, you know, um, create efficiencies in the healthcare system. One of the huge barriers there was, um, and I talked about this earlier, fee codes. Uh, governments, not some governments in Canada, uh, some provinces had done so, but most provincial governments had not, uh, would not provide uh, fee codes for virtual care. So they would not pay physicians. And I'll give you just a, an interesting little example. If you have a pacemaker, you have to go every six months and go to the hospital and get checked to see that, um, you know, your leads for that pacemaker are still in the right place. It's still functioning properly and all of that. And uh, so if you're in Northern Ontario, for example, sometimes you're traveling, you know, seven, eight hours and, and to go do that, or, you know, it's, it's, it's difficult for patients. There have been um, technologies for, for a while now, a few years now, where patients can do that at home. There's a device that they can use. They can uh, uh, check their um, pacemaker. It can send that data to a hospital remotely. A physician can look at it and say, yes, everything's in place. You're good. You don't have to come to the hospital. But the billing code for the physician to get paid for that work, to get paid to look at those results and make sure that the patient's fine or if something's not right, to be able to refer them for next steps, specifically said that the physician could only get paid if the patient, it was for a patient in hospital getting checked for their pacemaker. And so... That technology could not get into the healthcare system in Canada for a number of years. When the pandemic hit, now suddenly there were billing codes for physicians to be able to do that. And it seems like a really strange reason not to use a really great technology, but these are some of the barriers that innovators face when trying to get technologies into the system. 
And so the pandemic did a really good job moving forward some of the areas that had been stagnant for a long time. So, you know, I've used this slide um, for the last year, just kind of to talk about, I think, you know, um, as innovators, um, it's important to really understand or, or to, 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 to just think about the climate and um, think about what the pandemic did to elevate government and stakeholders and the public's sort of understanding of the importance of the medical technology. And in a minute, I'll talk to you. It's like, you know, why do we care about what the government thinks? I'll talk about that in a minute. I have a little slide on that and why that's so important in Canada. But, you know, I, as you heard from my background, I used to work in politics and and one of the biggest ways to drive decisions in government and to move, for, you know, things forward and help enable, you know, different decisions that need to be made or funding or legislation that, you know, changes the healthcare system is through pub the public. If the public cares about something, the government typically will start to work on it because that's who elected them and that's how they're gonna get reelected. So if you think about uh, life before the pandemic and this is my sitting at the kitchen table and you know, grandpa's upset about hydro rates and you know, dad's stressed out about a teacher strike and you know, and, and what do I want the government to fix? You know, the math curriculum and mom's you know, kind of annoyed that the electric car rebates aren't around anymore. And, you know, um, those are the kind of things people would think about. And those were the kind of issues that governments responded to. Um, but the pandemic really changed that, right? So I, you know, post pandemic, um, you know, what have people been talking about the last few years? Now they probably still will talk about all those other things, but, you know, we've had, you know, <clears throat> at least, you know, two years of people talking about Deal, you know, the wait times um, in our uh, healthcare system, hot topic right now. You know, people are acutely aware of the impact of the pandemic on wait times and that governments need to step up to address the backlogs and technology plays a huge role on that. You know, um, dad is really stressed out about um, his job and his career because he had such a disruptive last few years. And, you know, he's thinking about, you know, I think people care now about growing this sector um, and why it's important to have a really robust sector here in Canada. Um, I sort of use this example of masks because, you know, I think most people never used to think about innovation in relation to really basic, simple technologies like gloves and masks. And people would have thought a mask is a mask. We all know now that a cloth mask is not the same as a surgical mask, which is not the same as a respirator, an N95, right? Um, nobody realized that before, right? So it goes back to that getting the cheapest and technologies into the system as opposed to the ones that make a bigger impact on patients. And then things like, um, you know, rapid tests and people realizing, you know what, if I could for COVID at home, maybe there's other things. Um, you know, there's, there's, there's a lot that, uh, happened during the pandemic that really opened up people's eyes, how critical this industry is and opened people's eyes up to some of the reasons why um, we're not doing as, as well as we should with technologies in Canada. So, uh, so, oh, I wonder what, sorry, I'm just gonna check something really quick. Ah, oh, I lost a slide, okay. Um, maybe I'll, I'm going to, I'm going to stop here for a second and let's leave this slide on because it's got lots of great pictures on it, but I, I'm going to talk about why does it matter what the public thinks about this industry in relation to the government? What does the government have to do with the medical technology industry in Canada? So when you're thinking about Canada and there's a lot that differs from other jurisdictions, first and foremost, the government is the we're a we're a, a publicly funded healthcare system. Government is the primary funder for our healthcare system, and that brings in a very different dynamic on 
how technologies are viewed and evaluated and brought into the system. Um, and I do not think that the United States healthcare system is better than the Canadian healthcare system, but I'll give you an example of that. In a for-profit healthcare system like the United States, um, you are competing for patients, right? The more patients you bring into your hospital um, and the more you can charge for those services, the, the, the better you do as a business. And so in the United States, there's a lot of competition to get out there and get the best technologies and the best treatments and not for all hospitals, obviously, but there is an entire market in the United States for new and interesting innovations so that hospitals can attract patients that can afford those technologies and they can make a lot of money. And uh, you know that's what happens in a for-profit healthcare system. Um, in Canada, it's not that way. You know, uh, oftentimes, and, and governments have done a good job over the years trying to change the way we fund hospitals. Um, but, uh, you know, a significant portion of what hospitals do comes from a global budget. It's not based on the patients that walk in their door. Um, there is definitely a lot of more activity now on, uh, you know, on uh, uh, procedure-based funding, which is healthy and good because there's a bucket of money given to hospitals specifically for each patient for a procedure. A lot of times there are caps on those. So a hospital can only do a certain amount of procedures a year, and then the funding runs out. You know, we it's a completely different system, and that's a really important a dynamic to note. I will say that most medical technologies um, that are developed in Canada enter into the U.S. or other healthcare systems first before they get adopted into Canada. Even many that are developed here right at home in partnership with our own hospitals. Um, and then when it comes time to actually adopt that technology, um, even the hospital itself might not be able to bring that technology in. But that is a very common challenge in Canada for Canadian innovators. Um, the government also um, you know, has legislative oversight over our entire healthcare system. They legislate and regulate our healthcare system, and that's in, an important piece. Um, and they also have tools to drive economic development in Canada. So they do, you know, they have a lot of different programs for different sectors that can help drive activity in different sectors. And that's an important role that governments play in our country. And, uh, and therefore sort of understanding why it's important to grow the med tech industry um, is, is helpful to innovators. And I, for those who sort of, again, if you think back on pandemic and you think about, uh, watching the news and if everybody remembers, you know, um, after not being able to get our respirators from 3M because Trump tried, tried to stop them and then we finally got them, Doug Ford got up and said, never again, never again is this gonna happen in Canada. What does that mean for innovators? So yeah, so, you know, that means growing Canadian based companies, right? That means developing companies or growing companies that are, you know, not only developing technologies here, but manufacturing technologies here, right? And doing research and development here. And that's a really positive outcome um, from the, um, as a result of the pandemic. So, you know, government plays a bigger role on innovators. And I will say, you know, most medical technology companies, it's a very different industry from the pharmaceutical industry, they, most medical device, I don't want people to walk away from here thinking, you know, every innovator needs, you know, government relations people and all that. People, our industry does not have a lot of government relations folks in companies and those types of things. It's organizations like ours, like MedTech Canada, that act on behalf of the industry to do that work. Um, but we do focus on trying to raise awareness of what governments can do to make the system better. Um, more around sort of trends in the med device industry. I've, I've got sort of a couple slides on that. The first one is I wanted to put up, I mentioned before a health technology assessment body called CADIC, which is the Canadian Agency for Drugs and Technologies in Health. They did a, um, <clears throat> a project last year to talk about, you know, 10 trends shaping the future of healthcare in Canada. And I thought it was worth putting up on the screen. Um, this is more about the devices themselves, um, you know, really 
obviously I talked about virtual care, remote care, all of those types of things. It's a big area. Um, AI down here, um, when you think about things like medical imaging and the applications of AI, and I love talking to our medical imaging companies, you know, um, in the past you would have had a physician looking at those images and, um, you know, and, and making a diagnosis and that'll continue to happen. But when you layer AI into things like medical imaging, now you're starting to get diagnostic equipment where a patient may go in for a, an MRI or a CT scan on a specific issue that they're having, but uh, the equipment itself may catch something else. Or, you know, it may be able to look and say, you know what, this is not right. Or I've, you know, I've, I've grown and learned as a piece of equipment and, and here's some more in-depth detail. And, and the data behind that is just phenomenal. And um, that's a piece of the future for sure. Point of care testing, we all saw it with rapid tests, but I mean, I know so many testing companies that for years have, have been saying, uh, you know, people don't have to haul themselves into the doctor's office or the hospital for this. It's not just simple things like COVID, it goes way beyond that. And um, those are some of the, the trends and there's others as well, companion diagnostics, right? Um, so that's really learning, um, getting a diagnosis that helps to specify your treatment. Um, and in particular, there's a lot of relationship with the, between that and very specifically designed um, pharmaceuticals. And that happens a lot in oncology, for example, today. So um, these are just some of the trends. I'm gonna add some additional trends. So beyond the devices themselves, um, some of the trends for the industry in general, this would make sense. There's more of a trend towards local manufacturing because of all the supply chain issues that we've seen and the challenges of getting products here and what we saw during the pandemic. And we're still experiencing issues with that. Everybody would have experienced it, for example, in your regular life at Christmas or, or, or um, whatever holiday you perhaps have been celebrating recently where um, it's taken you a lot longer to get, <laughs> to get uh, you know, your orders delivered to your house. And this is a big issue for the industry as well. And I think a lot of people realize that we wanna increase our manufacturing here. I talked about a better understanding of innovation and I think that happened during the pandemic. There's a lot more partnerships between, um, by SMEs, I mean small and medium enterprises and multinationals. You you see a lot more innovative partnerships where you know pairing different technologies together and then bringing that to the healthcare system as sort of a a compendium a suite of you know treatment for a, a patient as opposed to a one off on a device partnerships with medtech companies and digital health companies happening all the time building supply chain resilience and multi supplier awards and procurement so I think another thing that comes out of the pandemic is Thankfully, we're moving away from a country that tries to do, um, you know, cheapest price, you know, put all your eggs in one basket, you know, we're going to give you supplier X all our business and, you know, um, and you're going to give us the best deal possible. And I think we realize that we really need to um, increase that competition. Um, there's a lot of focus on um, on in, in each province on homegrown companies and trying to make sure that they are part of, even if they're not being awarded everything in, a, in an RFP, that there's a component where, you know, you've got multiple suppliers for healthcare um, facilities to, to choose from when you're using new innovations or, or existing innovations. Um, some of the big challenges facing the med tech industry, and this will, this is my last slide. So, um, Supply chain modernization, so that's moving to value-based procurement. Right now, this global supply chain and shipping crisis, it's, it's a big challenge for the industry. The backlogs and wait times, it's, it's um, when I say challenge for our industry, it's, it's more the challenge of there are so many great technologies that can help with this, with this problem. How do we get these into the healthcare system and deployed you know, as quickly as a very not agile health system can? so that we can help tackle this problem. The regulatory environment in Canada, and that's how challenging it's, 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 Health Canada plays a really important role and we 
significantly support the role they play on safety and efficacy of devices, but that process could go quicker and we're a slower jurisdiction than say, getting an FDA approval in the United States. Um, access to health system data, um, we're terrible as a country. You can see the federal government right now negotiating with provinces to um, tell them that if we give you more money for healthcare, we want you to give us more data. We wanna you know, release that data more. The pandemic showed us that we don't have good data here and we don't collect it well and we don't have a lot of transparency around it. And that's a big part for innovators doing research and development um, for new technologies and then demonstrating that those technologies make a difference. Um, climate change is a big issue and the impact of um, legislation and regulations to protect the environment can certainly impact the med tech industry. Think of something as simple as single use plastics. You know, usually you think, okay, I can live without a plastic straw, I can live without, you know, a plastic bag, but um, there are very many medical technology for very good reasons that are used with plastics and and are for single use, uh, for infection prevention, control, things like that. So, you know, um, those are a lot of things that that we are, have been navigating over the last little while. And then obviously the slow pathway to adopt medical technologies in Canada. Oh, sorry, I, I lied. This is my last slide. Um, when we talk about the broader ecosystem, I could have put, I started putting logos on here. I could have put probably like a hundred. There's a ton of different organizations that help support startups in Canada. Um, this is just a smattering of them. They all provide different services and, you know, Can Health Network helps innovators get technologies into the healthcare system. They work with some hospitals to do that. Um, folks like Mars Venture Lab, they help with you know, trying to help find investors and, you know, different things like that, uh, with product design, all these sort of, there's, there's a ton of these different organizations that all help with different things. And, um, and it's a really challenging ecosystem to figure out how to find that help. And so um, it's not well organized, it's not well coordinated. Um, some of these organizations, they don't compete with each other, but they're kind of doing the same thing, but they're not necessarily working together. So I just kind of wanted to give you a sample of that. And that honestly is my last slide. So I will stop there. <laughs> and then we can go to questions. And I hope, uh, I hope that was a helpful presentation. Thank you very much, Nicole. That was an excellent talk with a great overview on the MedTech space in Canada. Uh, before I open it up for questions, a quick reminder again that this session is being recorded and by staying you're giving us consent to record and archive the video. Uh, I received a couple of questions uh, about the presentation. Uh, so again, it's being recorded and will be archived on the Sunnybrook Medventions website. Uh, I will post the website shortly in the chat. Mm -hmm. so, I do see two questions in the chat that I'm happy to start with. Is that okay? Absolutely. Okay, okay. So one of the questions, um, can diffusion occur internationally for products and devices approved by Health Canada, but not other international regulatory agencies, for example, FDA in the United States? That's a great question. Um, it depends on the country. Um, there are some countries that don't necessarily, um, that will accept, um, you know, Health Canada approval um, or FDA approval, or I forget the name of it, but in the, it's a CE mark in the, I think in uh, in Europe. But um, many uh, jurisdictions have their own approval process that you have to go through. So for example, you can't sell in the United States with Health Canada approval. You have to get FDA approval. Um, there is some initiatives that we've been working on to help and sometimes these are a challenge for innovators and sometimes these are helpful but um for example part of the process on being regulated by health canada is that you have to be audited by inspectors who come out and look at your manufacturing facility and different things like that we worked with health canada to create something called the medical device um single audit for m yeah single audit program mdsap that's one piece of the program where they bring in auditors that can actually audit you for 
I think it's seven or eight countries standards at the same time. That is just a part you need for the regulatory <laughs> approval piece, but, um, but no, you can't sell another in only in some jurisdictions can you sell with health Canada approval. Um, Sorry, just just to add to your point, Nicole, I, I think uh, one of the things I think might be important here, and please correct me if I'm wrong, is that there are some initiatives for regulatory harmonization as well, which yes. where, where regulatory authorities try to align technical requirements for the development and marketing of devices and drugs. And, and again, it, you have to still apply for regulatory clearance in different jurisdictions, but I think those initiatives taken by Health Canada and other regulatory bodies elsewhere uh, kind of try to streamline the process and make it easier for our innovators to uh, to access international markets. Yes, you're right. That is a constant um, issue that is always being worked on to try to continue to regulate. There's, there's a whole organization, uh, global organization, that does regulatory harmonization. <laughs> so it's, you know, um, how difficult is it to create a new billing code in Ontario and Canada? That is a really great question. Um, up until very recently, it was really difficult in Ontario. The reason is the whole process to negotiate billing codes was a process that happened between the Ontario Medical Association and the provincial government, and it was very politicized. So you would probably see it in the news, but there was a lot of back and forth, a lot of negotiation. Um, and within physician, within the physician community, so when you think about an organization like the Ontario Medical Association, you've actually got different clinical areas almost competing with each other, right? What would happen was the government would try to set a set amount of money that they wanted to spend total on physician fee codes. And then you'd kind of start, you know, duking it out within the different um, <clears throat> physician groups to, to almost to elbow in and say, okay, some of that money should be allocated over here or over there. But that would come at a loss to others. Um, and then a couple of years ago, um, I think it was right before the pandemic, all of that process went to arbitration and an arbitrator got involved in Ontario. And now there's a new process in place where the Ontario Medical Association has more autonomy to develop new billing codes, not blanket autonomy, but they actually have some autonomy to help develop new billing codes. And so it's an easier process and we work with the OMA. I'm not exactly sure how it works in other provinces. To be honest, I should know this. I have regional vice presidents that work on that, but um, uh, it's getting better. Um, it used to be awful. That would be my answer to that. There is a there is a catch all billing code for like there's no billing code. Can I use this code? But you know, to have a catch all code sometimes just it it, it like the amount of physician would get reimbursed for doing something isn't necessarily congruent with the work that they're doing, right? So they're also choosing, you know, what makes more sense financially, um, which is fair, um, you know, when you're looking at a new innovation. Um, how does MedTech help startups after the first successful implementation? Um, that's a really great question. And I, I would say, so we work on behalf of the whole sector to make the whole um, environment better for the industry. And we've had lots of success in different areas. And I'll give you one example. You know, I talked about backlogs, but during the pandemic, we did successfully, you know, lobby both the Quebec government and Ontario government to create a fund for some technologies that would help with um, some of the wait times. And there was a surgical innovation fund that went to hospitals during the pandemic. And in Quebec, there was a program that was started for companies to put their applications in. But um, I think what we do, so we, we try to change the environment for everybody, but um, that one-on-one -on -one help, um, it's really that, you know, I showed you the previous slide with all the different logos of all these other organizations that also do things. We help companies navigate and get to the right place based on what their needs are and where they need help and what the barriers are. We also help to everybody understand the environment and, and who you go to for what, um, whether it's dealing with procurement groups or regulatory affairs or things like that. Um, what are some of the stressing challenges in the regulatory environment in Canada? I think we talked about it a bit but already, but um, 
you know, the time, the amount of time it takes to, um, to get approval. And, and it's interesting because in some cases, um, the, uh, and, and, and we, what we saw during the pandemic is if Health Canada as a, a bureaucrats are, are well-resourced, um, they actually can move that process faster. So a lot of the reason is simply, it's a small department, the Medical Devices Bureau within, Med, within Health Canada, and they simply can't move through the applications fast enough. Um, but these things can be addressed. Um, there's other sub challenges. There's a ton of different challenges, but there's some like um, some countries, if you manufacture or develop or mostly manufacture a technology here, um, you can't sell it into that country until you get regulatory approval in the country in which it's manufactured. And that's a disincentive for some companies to do their manufacturing here. Um, so those are some of the issues. And then regulatory harmonization we talked about as well. And then a lot of it is, um, it's challenging for innovators. If you've been doing regulatory affairs your whole life, you could understand pretty easily how to do a Health Canada application. If you've never done it, there is not a lot of good guidance. It's a very self, like there's a self-assessment. And then there's a lot of, what do you mean by this? What do you, I, like, it's not a very clear, like, Submit X, submit Y, submit, you know, Z. And so um, we try to really improve the guidance around how to do applications for approval. Um, I'm just trying to get through this quickly. So just to clarify, if you have health care approval, you have a more streamlined process to get FDA approval and vice versa. There are just some things between what the FDA does and what Health Canada does, some evidence that needs to be gathered that can be used in both jurisdictions. The, Application process is not the same, but getting approval in one jurisdiction will usually help you get through the process in another. Um, I want to see a, a, a shout out to the Can Health Network, which is great. They're wonderful. They're doing great things. We just renewed an increased partnership with them. Um, oh, and then uh, this is a great question at the end. Um, how do I give my background? How did I involved in in MedTech Canada? Um, so I'll, I'll I'm just going to actually. What is one advice you give to introduce? Okay, same career. I'm just going to stop sharing here. So um, I actually, um, so I worked in politics for 15 years. I loved it, but it is a very taxing career. Um, I started when I was in my 20s and I lived downtown and I had no real responsibilities in life. And, and all my friends worked in politics and I could, you know, my, my social life was politics and my work life was politics. And then fast forward to, you know, at the end of that 15 year journey, I had gotten married, I had two kids, I got divorced, I moved from downtown to Markham and my life had changed significantly. And I woke up one day and thought, you know, I'm a single mother living in Markham. I really can't have a career that depends on like every four years, the voters get to decide if I have a job or not. Like I gotta get out. Um, I had no idea what I wanted to do, but I knew that I understand how the government worked and I knew, and I had other skills as well. I did a lot of fundraising and things like that. Um, but it's, it, you know, it's very hard to understand the government if, if you haven't been in there and understand how it works. So, uh, I was trying to figure out what, what I wanted to do. I had actually taken a break to spend six months with my kids, um, as I was going through my divorce, spend some time with them and then figure out what I wanted to do. And, uh, someone I had known from politics had gone to start working in a medical device company doing a GR role. I ran into an event. And he said, look, our industry association is for the first time going to add this government relations role. What do you think? And I said, I have never heard of, at the time it was medic. Um, so I actually didn't think I'd want the job, but I thought, okay, fine. I'll learn about it. We'll see. Right. Um, but I went to the interview and um, the, 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 my boss, my predecessor in the role that I do, I used to be the vice president of Ontario before I became president and CEO. Um, you know, I just, I always wanted, I've always wanted to do things that make a difference in people's lives and that I can be passionate about. When he talked about the med tech industry, I got very excited and very passionate about what the industry does. And I really could see, um, how, um, it had been a really underserved community in terms of, you know, 
the government and, and, and decisions to be made to um, improve the environment. And between that and just it being the right fit for me from a, you know, um, work-life balance versus politics perspective, um, that's how I decided to make the move. And that's a lot of time. So I really, when I was vice president of Ontario, it was really a government relations role. And I really, um, I just took over as president and CEO a year ago um, after 10 years in that old role when my predecessor retired. People come, to, uh, the people that work at Ventec Canada come from all over. My predecessor used to be the general manager of a, of a, of a drug company before I came to Ventec Canada. Um, so there's folks that come from industry into the association world or into roles like mine. There's others who's, who's come from government and advocacy backgrounds. Um, our VP of regulatory affairs used to do regulatory affairs in a member company. So it's a real mix in the med device industry and, and a real mix with our team at MedTech Canada. So, I mean, we're right at 5.30, but uh, so I'll, I will stop there and see if there's anything else that I missed or, you know. Thank you very much, Nicole. Uh, yeah, I'm just mindful that we are, uh, we hit the 531 right now. And yeah. <laughs> uh, if anyone has any further questions, feel, please feel free to email me and I'll be happy to uh, relay those questions to you, Nicole. Uh, That's great. I, I, I will add, sorry, the other piece was that was advice on, on um, getting involved. I left my contact information at the bottom, but I would say um, that, you know, uh, I guess my one piece of advice on, on, you know, I can give you lots of advice on getting involved with the politics and the government side, and that's a whole other beast around getting involved in government and volunteering and doing different things to 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 open up to the government side. But my big advice on pursuing a career in the, like we're a not for profit trade association, and um, pursuing any career in the not-for-profit sector and leading not-for-profit organizations, you gotta figure out what you're passionate about and 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 really um, get behind that and get excited about that. I think that's one of the big keys to success. So sorry about that. I, mean, I didn't mean to cut you off, but I realized I didn't fully answer the question. No, no, absolutely. I'm, I'm, no, that was great. Thank you so much, Nicole, for taking the time to educate our students and community. It was a pleasure to have you with us this uh, evening. Uh, thanks to our attendees uh, for joining us. Uh, please know that our next lecture is taking place on Thursday, January 19th at 4.30 uh, p.m. Eastern Time. Our next guest speaker will be Dr. Nardine Samuel and an exciting talk about the startup strategy and healthcare entrepreneurship. So uh, please mark your calendars and register for the event at our website, sunnybrook.ca forward slash medventions. Thank you again and see you next week. Thank you for having me and we'll see you later. Thank you, everybody.